Okay, so my name is Francis Batista. I'm one of the co-founders of Best Friends Animal Society. And uh, I had been working along with my wife in uh, the city of Los Angeles since the early 1990s, doing uh, small programs for the most part, event-oriented things, super adoptions, uh, spay-neuter promotions. Uh, we had foster programs and various other things. But they were uh, really add-ons and things to uh, bring value to the community. We'd been uh, looking to partner with the city for a number of uh, years, uh, but in fact, what had happened in the city of Los Angeles uh, was that there was a long-standing animal services director. Uh, in 1998, 99, he was replaced by someone who we felt had a great deal of promise, a man by the name of Dan Knapp. And he definitely brought a, a kind of a no-kill philosophy that was what the city was looking to achieve. However, uh, that his tenure didn't uh, work out. He had some health problems. And between his departure in 2001 and Brenda's arrival in 2010, we went through seven permanent and interim. Uh, Brenda was the seventh person to sit in that, in that chair of the general manager. So it was really not possible to get traction, to build a program, to uh, develop any kind of momentum towards the intended goal, the shared community goal, in fact, the stated goal of the city uh, council of uh, achieving a no-kill city. Uh, when Brenda arrived, uh, that was kind of like the door opened for us. The community had pulled together around someone with a, a proven uh, track record in no-kill and also someone who'd had the, the history and the legacy of having worked in San Francisco with Rich Avanzino. And so uh, we kind of dusted off our plans, and they were modeled on our work that we'd started in uh, Salt Lake in the, in the state of Utah, which was then at the time No More Homeless Pets in Utah, which was a program that was uh, funded by Maddie's Fund. And we liked the model, and we wanted to import that particular idea and adapt it to our work in Los Angeles. So uh, NKLA. It started out actually as, as uh, No More Homeless Pets Los Angeles, which was kind of a mouthful. And I'll tell you how we got beyond that. Uh, <laughs> so our, these are the founding members. And what we did was we really wanted to bring in folks who were uh, leaders in different uh, aspects of our work in the community. So we had two leading dog rescues, Downtown Dog and Karma Rescue, two cat programs, Kitten Rescue and Stray Cat Alliance, Stray Cat being principally oriented around uh, community cats, and uh, the Kitten Rescue, which is a great uh, cat adoption program, and then uh, Spay Neuter Providers and Found Animals, uh, which is, does a lot more than Spay Neuter, but was uh, running and uh, overseeing, uh, sort of had picked the pieces up from a number of different spay-neuter operations that had been taking place in the city, and I'm sure Amy can fill you in on that when we get to it. Uh, but they do a lot more than, than spay-neuter. But they were, came into this mix uh, by virtue, not of a funding foundation, but really the fact that they were managing and sitting on the board of and getting started a, several spay-neuter operations. And of course, Fix Nation, which was uh, really the first and possibly the only f uh, fixed clinic for strictly for cats, and community cats particularly. So we felt this was a very good mix to bring in different aspects of the community. Uh, and we wanted to be able to pivot from this collection of folks to as many members of uh, the rescue community and the professional community as possible. So that's, this was the, the founding group. And we first had our first meeting in December of 2010. Brenda had arrived uh, in Los Angeles in July of 2010, and uh, we started pulling these things together and had our first meeting in December. Uh, and it took us basically a year of trying to modify the uh, work that was being done, that our, our previous model that we'd used to adapt it to the, the realities of the city of Los Angeles, and also to uh, spread the word and build buy-in and uh, create a bit of uh, understanding of each other, or each other's needs of what was working, what didn't work, and how we could make this program be applicable to the community. So 
why Los Angeles? Well, Los Angeles, uh, for best friends, has always been an important city. It's one of the, we have one of our largest membership bases there. I think the largest membership base of the organization is in Los Angeles. Also, Los Angeles is uh, the second largest city in the country. It's a trendsetter. A lot of things that are, uh, happen in Los Angeles drive ideas uh, and both from a, a media perspective, an entertainment perspective, but also, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff that comes out of uh, Los Angeles and Southern California permeates the rest of the country, so why not no-kill? Huh? <laughs> uh, and also, Los Angeles is a very uh, challenging environment. It has, uh, it's something like 50 miles from north to south. It has uh, several million residents. It's incredibly diverse. It has basically a, about a 23% or 25% of the population is below the poverty rate, poverty level. Uh, there are segments of the community where English is not even a second language. Uh, there are uh, enormous challenges from a variety of points of view, and so we felt that if it can be done in Los Angeles, there really is, can be done anywhere, because there are so many representative kind of model cities within this uh, very uh, expansive and diverse uh, metro metropolitan area. Well, more than metropolitan area in the city. So I want to show you this. We are the best friends of animals. We are a movement. We are a coalition of organizations and passionate individuals dedicated to making Los Angeles a no-kill city. Last year, more than 17,000 healthy or treatable animals were killed in LA city shelters. Each one an individual. Each one a loving pet worth saving. 17,000. That number should be zero. And it can be. There is a solution but only if the people who care work together. Join us and help make LA into NKLA. That is a very moving and powerful video that uh, was done for us, and I'll, we'll get to the uh, sort of the genesis of some of this stuff uh, in a few slides here. But uh, it stated the, the premise of the work that we were doing about uh, in our baseline year, and we, you know, a lot of the work that we do is very, it's all very uh, data-driven, metrics-oriented. And uh, in 2011, which was the year before the, uh, that we used as our baseline measurements of, for the, the shelter data, the, uh, about 55,000 animals entered LA City, just LA City alone, that doesn't count the county, 55,000 animals, of those, about 23,000 uh, were killed. And on a 90% save rate, if we were looking at what would it have taken in that year to become, uh, to cross that 90% threshold into the realm of the, the rarefied air of a uh, no-kill city, we would have had to have saved 17,000 more animals in 2011. So that's where that 17,000 came from. Uh, so that was the challenge. How are we going to both, you know, make the numbers go down and make, the, so noses in, drop the number of noses entering the shelter and increase the number of noses getting out of the shelter safely. So that was really the challenge, and that was stated in that manifesto, and I'm, I'm sorry that that was not, uh, able, you're not able to see that. So the strategy was a comprehensive community assessment, uh, using data to build a plan for the community, building a strategy as a community team, and data analysis points uh, to geo and economic targeting. So what we were looking at here was a very extensive uh, analysis of what is the city? What are the issues? What are the problems? What are the communities that need the most help? How do we get the information that we need, the work that we need? How do we get it to where it's actually going to be doing the most good? And, you know, we weren't expecting great, you know, everybody knows, well, we know what's going on. Everybody knows the, the problem. Everybody knows, expects and thinks they have a handle on where, what communities and what zip codes and what neighborhoods are, are, are having the most challenges. But still, we were uh, surprised, and a lot of the information was really quite interesting. So we, uh, one of our uh, data geeks put together, and that's the city of Los Angeles. You see, it stretches all the way up from Silmar on the top there down to San Pedro 
at the bottom, and that's a, a good stretch of land. Um, so we, this is just, a, I'm not going to try and anal analyze this map here, but that gives you an idea of the kind of data that was generating. And this was just one page out of what, something we called the brick. It was a book this thick. And it had all kinds of breakdowns of, the, of information and data. Uh, proximity to vets, languages in the home, number of vehicles in the home, income, uh, uh, what would work. We had to figure out how, how are the programs that we're applying and what were the problems with the programs that had existed? Why weren't they reaching the, the, the targeted demographics and the, and the communities that we wanted to? And some things very simply that we knew were a problem. So there had been, it was an extensive uh, spay neuter operation in the city. There were mobile units, but a lot of them were uh, means tested. That means people had to demonstrate either they lived in the community, their income, what their income was. And often people, you know, couldn't prove they, where they lived because they weren't the primary, they didn't have their name on the gas bill or they were, you know, they were living in a garage or in a car or that, you know, they were just, that's where they happened to lay their head and they might have had an animal, but they were not able to prove and therefore qualify for some of these means tested spay neuter uh, resources. Likewise, we, Los Angeles has a lot of undocumented uh, residents and so that was a, a barrier to come into a situation with you know, people in, dressed in some official gear and say, you know, uh, here's, I can't prove that, I'm, that where I live, I can't, you know. So all of those things were challenges that we wanted to overcome. So we decided that for certain communities, we knew that uh, if you lived in this neighborhood, you needed help. It, you know, you didn't need to prove it. If you, all you needed to have was like a piece of junk mail or, or something that anyway uh, located you in this general zip code and you qualified. So that's how we qualified some of our spay neuter. And a lot of it came out of this type of analysis. And also we looked at you know, what uh, was coming into the shelter, the breeds, the numbers of, of each category, the, what were the most typical breeds coming in, dogs, cats, uh, and in which shelters. There are six shelters in the LA uh, system, and each of them has kind of a, a profile that's characteristic of the community that they represent. Um, so the components of the strategy uh, was to build a coalition. Obviously, we couldn't do this alone. We wanted to fast track adoption, adoptions. We wanted to target high volume spay neuter, and we wanted a comprehensive advertising campaign. Uh, the coalition started with that, those, uh, I guess, eight organizations, uh, the LA Animal Services, because of a conflict of interest based on best friends taking on one of the city shelters that had been disused, and we were then uh, kind of a uh, a contractee to the city, uh, LA Animal Services, uh, through conflict of interest, stepped off its state in an advisory role. And then, now that has built out to something like 97 partners. So from those first seven, eight, it's now 97. Uh, so adoptions. We wanted to really build capacity and measure results uh, and also really, as we look to the future, we needed to be aware that we had a responsibility for the animals in the shelter that were uh, dying. And so simply to say, okay, let's go put all our resources into spay and neuter, uh, that is a great idea, but really we had a number of animals that we needed to, be, needed to be accounted for that were in the system and that were still in the system and would be in the system no matter how much we invested in a, in a quick fix try, or uh, tried to drive the spay neuter solution. So we needed that adoption component to really look after the animals in the shelter. And so we set up a, uh, a system of incentives based on the baseline years. So all of our partners, if they adopted uh, over their numbers in say 2011, then we would give them $150 for each adoption over that number that they did in that baseline year. And, and incrementally it increased. So then it was over the 2012, 2013, and that was kind of an incentive to, to move the numbers. And it wasn't for animals pulled from the shelter, it was for adoptions. And again, I think that was something that followed the Maddie's model. And again, because the city had a, uh, a system of their own partner programs, the New Hope Partners, the New Hope Partners uh, had a relationship with the city of LA Animal Services and one of the requirements to be a New Hope partner was to report their results, so report their adoptions. So that was a big, that saved us the effort because we were able to get the, the, those numbers each month 
from LA Animal Service. So, so one of our primary requirements was that whoever was part of the coalition first had to become a New Hope partner. And that then just streamlined a lot of the work and it also uh, made it easier for the partners because they didn't have to do you know, double reporting. They just had one reporting location and then we were able to pull those numbers from them. And spay neuter, we did really uh, primarily economic targeting. Who uh, can we help who would not otherwise be able to afford it? And so it was targeted principally to economically uh, underserved communities, but also we did some geo, uh, geographic targeting based on those kind of points that I mentioned, and also uh, with respect to zip codes that had, we knew were, were putting out a lot of numbers. So we had a comprehensive advertising campaign. We wanted to excite the public, and we got involved through uh, members of Best Friends, uh, Lee Clow, who is an advertising genius, the kind of the brains behind Apple and the Apple brand. If you read Steve Jobs' book, is a whole chapter devoted to Lee Clow. He uh, is kind of semi-retired. He uh, sort of oversees or takes special interest in a couple of uh, clients, and they've done pro bono work for Best Friends for a long time now. One is Apple, and the other is Best Friends. So, uh, and the NKLA rather. So they have really made an enormous commitment to them. This is the kind of advertising that we launched with. It was very, uh, it was intended to be raise attention, raise questions. What is it? Is it a clothing brand? Is it a dog? Who knows? What is this about? Um, the problem, and this is uh, for anybody who uh, wants to undertake something like this, was that when we uh, launched, this was intended to be a mobile app driven campaign so that people would drive down the street and say, what the hell is this? And they would put in NKLA and we had search optimization and everything was up top so that people could then have a quick find of what is NKLA. However, our website was not ready when this launched, so that's a big screw up. Uh, and we played catch up for a while. But we got a lot of bounce on these things and they were very popular, this kind of dramatic image. And again, uh, they tailored this and crafted this very carefully to have uh, this, these kind of, this particular look in, on these animals, that they, were, they weren't happy, they weren't sad, they were just uh, like challenging almost. You know, we are here, wh what are you, where are you? And it was engagement with the eyes and these very straight faces, very powerful stuff. And the bus sides, um, wall, wall uh, plasterings like the other and billboards around town. Kevin Nealon. Hi, I'm Kevin Nealon. I'm here to talk to you about gonorrhea. And I'd like to talk to you about lazy ear. I would like to talk to you about infantile baldness. I'm Kevin Nealon, and sadly, some people will already have forgotten who I am. And I'm here to talk to you about Common the problem with whole Canadians. The problem is getting there worse. There are too many whales. And worse, this affects but mostly us. you. I'm Kevin Nealon. I'm here to talk about trench mouth. glaciers. And today I would like to talk Overrated. about bulimic insomnia. Backwards baseball. Hats. Raise awareness. Lower expectations. Go to your ATM. Talk to him. And I'm here to talk to you about facial Double sided cat hair rollers. Don't just sit Complain. there. Complain. Can you be that Blastic selfish? Plastic trichinosa It's an unfixable People problem. like Tobin. You F can't factor. smell it. You can't hear it. 3D. You can't imagine it. And you are to blame. probably know an out-of-work astronaut. Time is running out. Skateboarding in Proper hospitals. Proper deodorant application. Clad malaria. Doctors without underwear. Kangaroo impotence. I don't mean to scare Texting you. while scuba diving. read my lips. Northern Iraq, Mongolia. Every day. Tampa Bay. Jars of clay. Nail biting. Bad posture. Turf toe. Fanny packs. Crack. I'm Kevin Nealon. There are a lot of problems out there. And unfortunately, we can't do much about a lot of them. But here's one you could do something about. Homeless pets. Spay and neuter your dog or cat, or adopt them from an animal shelter. It's that easy. Go to nkla.org to find out more about how you can help, and let's solve this problem. Let's make Los Angeles a no-kill city forever. I don't know if you caught it, but the dog growled at him when he went down. <laughs> um, so we launched with that kind of energy, and it really, this was a, uh, a you know, had some legs on the internet. Uh, it became something of a, an event in its, at its time. And so all of this pushed the NKLA concept out into the public. 
and that was very exciting. But it still took a while for it to, to, for it to really get traction. And over time, then this brand, the NKLA brand, has become incredibly powerful and effective and very, very widely known. Uh, and so the, uh, and it really took, started to get traction when we branded our super adoptions as the NKLA Super Pet Adoption Festival, or Super Adoption, sorry. And also when we uh, opened a second facility in Los Angeles called the NKLA Pet Adoption Center on the west side. And that has really become a magnet for volunteers, adoption, various other things. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brenda. And right after that, I came to this conference. It wasn't in Atlanta, but I came to this conference. And I had, had a, I had talked to Rich Avanzino before I accepted the job and said, what do you think, Rich? And he told me two very important things. He said, when you go to L.A., go with a don't know mind. Don't assume that anything that you've done before that has worked will work in L.A. Don't assume that you know the answers. Just go and, f and start figuring it out as you go. And he said the other thing is to um, call Francis Batista. <laughs> so I did those two things. And then I came to this conference, and I went around to everybody and best friends, and, and I kept just bugging them, saying, how are you going to help us get to no kill? How are you going to help us get to no kill? And finally, you know, after I would bugged almost everyone at best friends, Gregory Castle and I pulled up um, two chairs behind a curtain, which was a, the meeting room we had there. And he said, are you serious? And, uh, and he asked me a few questions. And by the end of the conference, Julie Cant Castle stood up. And when she was doing her closing speech, she said, and by the way, we're going to take L.A. to no kill. And the crowd just stood up. So the energy was there. The momentum was there. I think she then had to go back and get permission from the board. But, <laughs> you know, what's wrong with a little spontaneity? So, uh, you know, that's how it really started in L.A. And, and it is through collaborative partnerships. There is no way that the city of LA could have done anything near what we've done uh, in these almost five years, four well, years, three, I guess. Yeah, but, well, since you got But yeah, actually absolutely. three years of really productivity uh, <clears throat> without partnerships. Uh, we, we do have about 220, I think, New Hope partners who are small nonprofits who pull animals from us. Uh, of those, 97 are NKLA members. And, you know, what does that mean? That means we don't get along with each other. We don't get along with ourselves. You know, we have judgments. And as soon as we can put those judgments down, we can save them all. And as soon as we can work together. And, and that sort of has been the, the path in uh, Los Angeles. And it, and it was difficult. Previous executive directors would not follow a specific agenda. Maybe someone thought it should be all spay neuter. And then they would, you know, um, chase that person out of town or whatever. And, but this has been a different kind of thing. The, the mayor at the time, I said to uh, the mayor when he hired me, you know, I haven't had a job in a long time that didn't have a contract. And he said, well, we don't do contracts in the city of Los Angeles. And I said, well, that's not very encouraging. And uh, he said, well, I've got three more years on my term, and I'll guarantee you three years. And he did. He backed me. The political leaders backed me. And it really does, it's got to be the political leaders, it's got to be the small nonprofits and the large nonprofits. Prior to this, I was uh, in the private sector, uh, still in animal welfare. And the big, one of the big sea changes for me is that, you know, whether I was in San Francisco or Seattle or out in Walnut Creek or wherever I was, um, I did not particularly like these big groups coming in and taking our money. And I, you know, and I was pretty outspoken about that, whether it was Best Friends or the A or HSUS. And I want to tell you, right today in LA, I've got my hands out to all those groups and more. Because it is only together that we can do this. And there is enough money in the community. I mean, there are people, just like some people want to go to a shelter to adopt. Some people want to go more to an adoption center like um, Best Friends is set up in LA. Some people want to adopt from a private rescue. Some people want to be mercilessly screened. Some people don't want to be asked any questions at all. There are all sorts of flavors out there. And the same thing is true for donors. Some of your donors will give to a multitude of organizations. Some of your donors will invest in a large organization. Some will invest in a small 
So, you know, it really is about stop worrying about everything and just start thinking about what we're doing and collaborate with anyone who is willing to work with you. I think that was one of the big lessons I learned from Rich when I was in, I was in San Francisco when Rich took uh, San Francisco SPCA, took San Francisco to be the first no-kill city in the nation. And I was the development director. And the day that he announced without telling us <coughs> that um, <coughs> San Francisco was going to be no-kill, I thought, holy shit, I've got to raise money. For I was the development director. I had to raise the money. But what, but what I really knew about Rich was that he would not leave me out there uncovered. He, was, he had the programs. He had the messaging. I mean, people, start, people loved it, and they started giving us money. And, you know, it, it made it possible for me to meet and exceed all of my goals in development, which, you know, was really a wonderful thing. And, and it, you know, it was just a, a difference. It, it was the sort of the ability to believe that, yes, we can do it. Because nobody before really thought we could. It was like, well, you know, maybe, but it's probably not going to work. But it was just that bold move out. Yes, we can. We can. We can save them all. We can do, you know, we can do the work that we need to do. And, and I think that's uh, just sort of incredibly important to, to think about the hope. The other thing that, that Rich uh, taught me, and, and I just cannot emphasize this enough, is that anybody who loves animals gets to play. It doesn't matter whether they are rich or poor, young, old, what their ethnicity is, what their orientation is if they do things exactly my way or not. Everyone who really loves animals gets to play. And I think that is a, such an important message in our communities to invite everyone to the table and to work with them. And sometimes you've got to adjust a little bit because they don't exactly see things all the same way. But, you know, in LA, uh, Best Friends has a little uh, no bash, no trash. And I think you see that throughout the conference. It's like, let's don't, let's don't look for our differences. Let's look for our similarities and let's move forward together for the animals. So, I, you know, it's been a wonderful experience for me. I've, uh, I'm coming up on five, almost five years in L.A. Um, and it's the only reason I've been able to, to be there, stay there, and do this is because of the support of best friends, other large organizations, and a multitude of small privates. So. Thank you, Brenda. And uh, Amy Gilbreth uh, is going to tell you all about her work and actually she's kind of built uh, found animals from the ground up and it's uh, to describe it as a local organization is ridiculous it's a national organization multifaceted does all kinds of things beyond what you see here and also I think Amy should probably touch on some of that stuff as well because um, many of you probably connect with uh, found animals through their microchip so yeah. take it away Amy. So uh, now, in, in 2015, we have, we're a sort of a unique beast in the animal welfare world because we do have some programs that are national, like our affordable microchips and our free registry, which if you haven't, you should stop by our booth and hear about. Our Saving Pets Challenge, did any of you participate in our Saving Pets Challenge? It's an online crowdfunding competition. The winning organization, which was an all-volunteer transport group, raised $250,000 in 30 days. So if you didn't hear about that this year or participate, you should look for it next year. So those are some of the things we do nationally, but locally in Los Angeles, we kind of act like a humane society would almost. We do things in spay neuter, we do things in adoption, we do things in policy, we have a kitten foster program, but back in 2010, we didn't have all of those things. So back in 2010, the one area where we had really invested in Los Angeles was spay neuter. We were doing grant making for several local organizations. And one of those organizations, the biggest one at the time, had lost their executive director very suddenly. And so in addition to being uh, heading up Found Animals, I was acting executive director of this spay neuter organization. At the same time, we were starting a joint venture with another nonprofit locally to launch a mobile spay neuter unit. So I was living and breathing spay and neuter, which was why I was initially invited uh, to come on to the steering committee for NKLA. And now, I'm very happy to say I only have one job title, and both of those organizations that I mentioned, both the mobile unit and the, the chain of three nonprofit stationary clinics, are under their own management. I still sit on the board, but I don't have any day to day responsibilities. Uh, and they do jointly, I mean, we're very lucky in Los Angeles, thanks to grants from my organization and, and even more money from PetSmart Charities, we have a lot of accessible and affordable spay neuter in Los Angeles. 
Do we have everything that we need in every neighborhood that we need? Maybe not, but if you look at where we are now versus 10 years ago, those resources are available in LA in a huge way. So when um, Francis and Julie sort of came to me and said, we're thinking about doing this coalition thing and we're thinking about taking LA no kill, to say that I was skeptical might have been an understatement. <laughs> might have been an understatement. Um, but I have a hard time saying no to any good cause and sometimes even to some bad ones. So we got started. And I have to say that for any of you who are thinking about doing this, you know, you can't let the fact that it might be hard or the fact that maybe everybody in your community doesn't get along stop you. If you look at the way those first few meetings went when everybody was sort of a little suspicious of each other and <laughs> kind of eyeballing each other across the table and what is really going on here and you know, are you serious about this, to where we are now, it's like a family. And we've come so far. And even our programs at Found Animals have evolved sort of in tandem with and KLA. So for example, we did not have a kitten foster program in 2010. We will do about 1,200 kittens through our kitten foster program this year, many of them pulled from LA City shelters through one of the best friends centers because as part of going through the data exercise, I realized that that was a big part of the problem and that we needed to be helping with that. Same thing, um, we now do some grant funding to some surrender prevention programs. So do any of you guys follow Lori Weiss and Downtown Dog Rescue on Facebook? If you don't, you should, because they do an absolutely amazing program that we fund for them, and now we fund it with a couple of other organizations where they have a counselor who sits at the shelter and talks to people who are coming in to surrender their pets and says, what is going on? And tries, if that person doesn't really want to surrender their pet but feels they have no choice, tries to connect them with resources and support. And we started this as a pilot a couple years ago, and we didn't know what to expect. And we started it at the shelter in South Los Angeles, uh, Chesterfield Square, that is the most underserved. The entire population of that service area lives below the poverty level. And I think maybe we had some misconceptions about why people were giving up their pets. And what we found is that the vast majority of the people who were coming in to surrender their pet didn't really want to. They felt like they didn't have a choice. They knew that their dog or cat had a medical issue and maybe was suffering, they had no money to treat them, they thought that turning them over to the shelter was the right thing to do for the pet, or they had gotten a fix-it ticket uh, for spay and neuter and they didn't know where to get the resources and so they were gonna turn over their pet. And again, we're lucky that through Downtown Dog Rescue and some other things, in many, many cases, we can actually connect those folks with the resources they need to keep that pet in the home. But that's a program that we didn't have in 2010 and that I might not have decided to step up and fund had it not been for the work of the coalition. So certainly, the Found Animals Foundation looks very different now than it did then, largely because of NKLA. It's been an amazing experience for myself and my team and we're very proud to be part of this. Thank you, Amy. And uh, Amy referenced those early meetings, and it was a bit like detention class. It was, uh, you know, it was sort of everybody was sitting there. Somebody was carving their initials in the desk, you know, that sort of thing. It was, uh, but it, it worked, you know. It, we, we stuck with it and it all, because, you know, there was, just like in any community, there's these uh, long-standing uh, rivalries, conflicts. You have the, you know, cat organizations, dog organizations, you know, everything is kind of like, at all the history that has developed over the years in any community kind of surfaces in these sort of situations. And all that needed to be, not, it wasn't worked through, we just had to find other things to, to agree on and other things to work on. And as we started building other uh, points of connection, all those other things started to fade away. So over to Mark. So uh, really quick, this is a result uh, time, which I'm gonna touch on in a minute. But before I do that, I just wanna kind of talk about some current uh, happenings with NKLA and how things have kind of evolved since, uh, since we've launched NKLA in 2012. Um, it was really important and key, as Francis and Amy both spoke about, and Brenda, um, forming the coalition, eight groups, very influential uh, rescue groups um, and nonprofits within Los Angeles, and where we might not have had a relationship or a trust base with certain groups to try to grow the coalition, potentially Amy and Found Animals did, or Kitten Rescue did, and it was a really good utilization of us getting on the same page first and foremost to really start spreading this bigger picture. Yeah, the lights on. Um, spread this kind of bigger picture uh, goal setting. Um, and oftentimes, it really started with how, how to open up communication. We could understand how we got through to each other. Um, you know, 
to kind of take that forward with, with other groups. And as you've seen, you know, eight turned into 35, then it turned into 56, and now it's 97. Um, year to year to year, uh, a lot of it's been the progress as well. Like Amy said, I think she's not alone in the fact that a lot of people are like, and especially in Los Angeles, probably for a good 15 years, we we're going to be no kill, you know, in 2001, 2003, and 2005. But this was really the first um, community-wide, statistically driven, coalition-based effort to get this done. And every year, we found believers and more and more believers. Um, with the coalition, we have expanded beyond just uh, the New Hope partners, the partners that pull from Brenda. We absolutely need rescue partners to do the adoptions and the transporting of animals and those type of things to get the animals that are showing up in the, in the, in the um, city shelters out. But we have spay neuter groups, obviously, as well, that are working on trying to reduce the, the not coming in. We have groups that are community-based that work um, to educate and outreach in, in communities. Um, so we've expanded the role. They're all nonprofits, um, but with 97, about 56 uh, pulled from the shelter. The rest are doing some other various things that are contributing to our success. And I think it's, there's a, a couple of other things in LA that I want to point out that have been equally um, helpful uh, because there's a lot of different areas to kind of focus on. One of which is being puppy mill bands and Elizabeth Oric um, and various uh, other. Uh, Stakeholders and organizations have really worked hard to um, ensure that in most areas in our city, in the city of Los Angeles, but even surrounding areas for the most part, you aren't allowed, puppy stores aren't allowed to have puppy mill dogs. They have to, um, you know, get their animals from rescue groups or shelters. Um, and, it's, and Amy and Found Animals really stepped up to the plate a lot, doing a humane um, sourcing of, of pets through stores for years now. Um, and it gave that opportunity. So the fact that we weren't, um, you know, our stores, you know, our communities weren't full of puppy mill dogs, or legally aren't full of puppy mill dogs. Those kind of things help. So there's a lot of legislative things. The state of California also bans BSL. Now there's ways that people work around it through dangerous dog ordinances or spay and neuter ordinances. So it's not that we don't battle that stuff, but we do have some legislation that work in our favor there as well. Um, so it's been really good, but I'll tell you what, guys, the challenge is we have a very focused intention. We want to see the end of cats and dogs being killed in shelters, and it's a huge number of animals. So there's so many different, and it's funny because Kevin Nealon's talking about skateboarding in hospitals, but it feels like there's never shortages of issues in the animal welfare world, whether it's communities that are next to you, you know, who's doing what about the chickens, who's doing what about the whales. Support. But one of the things that we had to focus and narrow on was we were going to support the city, which is 503 square miles of area, which is humongous, so it's big enough, plenty to keep us busy there, 56,000 animals, as Francis said, and a lot of it is really trying to stay on task and saying, if we're doing this task, is this going to help us get to what we're ultimately trying to achieve? Because it's like running a marathon, right? And if I get involved in a, you know, in a chicken raid, which plays to my heart, it's almost like I'm going to run a mile sideways and then get back on course. Um, it's really conserving energy and staying on task, which is difficult. Um, because we care about a lot of stuff. But we really are committed to seeing that needle move for the reasons that Francis said. We really do believe it can be a large domino effect. There's over 200 no-kill communities in the country. LA with the influence with the craziness, with all of the things that you've heard that are absolutely real. Totally um, true, yeah. <laughs> but it's still happening there, uh, will be huge. And it's going to happen there. And we're on track to do it. And as you can see, uh, we have this broken out. The orange, uh, it's really probably hard to see for you guys in the back, but the orange bar is dogs. So the amount of dogs, and this is euthanasia and killing. Um, so in 2011, 9,454 dogs uh, were being killed or euthanized in the city, in the six city shelters. In three years, that's now at 4188. Um, cats, which includes all cats, underage kittens to all cats, is the dark gray. That was at 13,558 in the calendar year of 2011, which was the year before we started in KLA, just to be clear. That now is down to 7,954. And within that cat population, it's important to note for us in LA, the biggest uh, challenge for us is underage kittens. 
We get over 9,000 into the shelter system. Really hard. City doesn't have a great infrastructure to be able to bottle feed, uh, those type of things. So when we did community analysis and things like, you know, and Andy touched on this, we both saw and recognized, hey, this is an area that we don't know that there's a lot of people in the community helping the city with. This is where the gap we need to start filling. So Amy opens a nursery. We open a nursery. She's doing 12 to 1,300 kittens. We're doing 2,000 kittens. So you've seen a huge difference, but you obviously see we have more to go. So the kittens were at, out of 13,000 that were killed, and you can have 7,200, almost 7,300 were you know, underage kittens. And now that's at 4841. Good progress, right? But a lot of work still to be done. But it, you know, we target and we, we continue to look at these kind of things and say, okay, what's next? What, what can we do next for cats and for dogs? And one of the lessons that we learned is the initial plan that we put in place to make this happen has been extremely successful. You guys, we've raised, actually, if you want to go to the next slide, we've raised the save rate which encompasses basically the animal activity. It's the amount of animals that are coming in, and you divide that by the, anim the animals that die um, in care, the animals that are killed or euthanized, the animals that are lost in care, even, even though um, they're probably alive, they've been stolen, but nonetheless, it, it, we're gonna count it against the save rate. Um, you can see the save rate increase 15% for dogs in the first three years, and for cats, 20%. So it's been huge. The thing that was a challenge that we learned from the dog started at 71%, so we'll increase to 20%, potentially even as, as soon as this year, and be at no kill for dogs for, in the city of Los Angeles as well. Um, but for cats, even though we've increased more, we have, we have such a longer road to take to get to that 90%. But we're up to it. And you know, this is the thing that you have to understand. You're gonna make, you're, you're gonna see things and say, wow, this is something I learned. Uh, I wish we would have thought of this two years ago, but you have to go through the process and you learn that it's been highly successful. We're not afraid. Uh, making mistakes because we learn from it and we grow. Um, but it's been, obviously you can see, the lines have gone up. And the overall save rate for Los Angeles is 74% as of 2014. And we're on track right now to have about a 78% save rate. And we're in the middle of summer, so it's looking pretty good. Um, cats' save rates are increasing, but we have some, some work to do there, and we're going to do it. And one of the things that we do, we still meet monthly as a steering committee, and we look at data every single month. I love data, I'm a nerd, I'm giving a data presentation at two o'clock. In that presentation, <laughs> if you come see it, there's a lot more examples from Los Angeles, yeah. right? But it wasn't like, hey, set a course and pray. It was like, set a course and check in, and we look at the numbers every month, and we say, what looks odd, or what's working that we need to do more of? Where would we have expected to see more of a difference, and we don't, and what is that telling us? So this, slide represents there's a lot of conversation that goes on every single month about what's working and what's not and where we might need to adjust and evolve. So as much as our initial strategies were really good, they have evolved over time and we are constantly questioning what could we do differently, what could we do more, what should we stop doing? And the underpinning for that is that we share data. There are no secrets. And, and I think, you know, every matter of fact, I just sent uh, Mark uh, last night, I think it was, or the night before, the. You know, I get reports on the 10th, or by the 15th of the month, they immediately go to Best Friends. He dis disseminates them to uh, his steering committee, and we just share the information so that we try to problem solve together. Our data is posted on the website, by the way. If you go to Los Angeles Animal Services and go to the tab that's about us, and go down to Wolfstat, that's W-O-O-F-S-T-A-T, those are our statistics, and they're for all of the six shelters that roll up into one, you know, top sheet. Now, when you do that, and then you look at Mark's numbers, you may see a slight difference, and that's because we're on a fiscal year and he's on a calendar year, so and nobody's not telling the truth. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's important to note, the way that the Coalition Steering Committee works these days is very similar to the initial uh, purpose. Uh, it's really to share information, to make sure that we're on the same page, discuss large issues in NKLA, we all have groups that we can disseminate information to. Amy has a lot of relationships and better relationships that we can rely on her to talk to groups that potentially can help fill gaps. We have set it up almost now as boards. We actually have working groups too, so we can get more coalition members involved. We do rotating seats. So there's two or three different coalition members every quarter that rotate onto the initial steering committee to get some fresh blood and perspective mm -hmm. in there. Um, but the working groups really kind of focus on specific things. So the first working group that's head, uh, headed by um, 
uh, uh, employee of, of mine and Amy's, uh, is, is dealing with landlord issues, which is a huge obstacle, right, for, for large dogs. Um, so there's various people, and Brenda and the city actually have a working group that are also doing the same, which we don't think it's actually necessarily bad that we have two different groups trying to do the same thing so long as they're sharing communication, because it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. And the more the merrier, quite frankly, on that. So we've really kind of tried to structure to get more people involved, to not, you know, having 20 groups um, at the steering committee, I don't know how productive that would be. So we're really trying to find other focuses. So, you know, trying to deal with the cat issue, obviously, would be a great working group as well, um, some of those type of things. So that's kind of how it's evolved. Um, and something that we do, I think, as a steering committee that you guys got to think about in your communities, those 97 groups that are part of the coalition do not agree on everything. Even the members of the, the smaller group, the seven or eight or ten that are on the steering committee, we don't agree on everything. We don't all agree on what is the best way to do X, Y, or Z. But what we do do is we recognize that everybody is trying to help animals, and if you are trying to help animals, you are welcome at the table, and we do not spend time saying, you're doing it wrong. Right? We talk to each other, we educate, we share thoughts, we share information. Many of the groups have evolved the way they're doing things over the years, but that's not been forced upon them. They haven't been ashamed into that, right? It's everybody's welcome. If you're trying to help animals, you're welcome to be part of the coalition, and we, like the no bash, no trash, we don't spend time on that crap. You can't. You have to be willing to say, my way is not the only way. I have the way I want to help animals that I'm really committed to, and I can respect that somebody else's way of helping animals is different, but it's still good. And I think it's, you know, it's really important to have the relationship with the public shelter and to let that evolve. You know, I, when I went to L.A. and found out that I had, I, I, I emailed the people before I got there and I said, send me the job descriptions for the people who aren't part of uh, a union. And they said there aren't any. Uh, I have four unions uh, within the um, Los Angeles Animal Services. And that was a little bit daunting for me because I came from a pi private background. But what I can tell you, union people have heart. Union people love animals. And have we had to make some transitions and have we had to work with some people who maybe needed to find out that they had heart and loved animals, we have, you know. And, but, it, but it's been a process, and, and I would say that probably from the very beginning until today, the ease of going into the shelters and pulling animals has probably gotten better. Um, people now will say, well, let's just call best friends and see if they can't take them. You know, it, it's a different kind of uh, culture, and cultural change is slow. But, when, but nobody really wants to kill animals. Nobody really wants to see animals hurt. So when it starts to feel better, they start to get empowered and they start to join into the activities. And, you know, I've got people in the shelter who are excited about the work. And I would say more are excited than aren't excited. I mean, it's, it's really a different day in L.A. and it is because of the coalition and the collaboration. Yeah, and I think it's important too that uh, just to echo a little bit what Brenda said is that we really measure ourselves by our community. It is not a big, uh, you know, it's great that we have a no -kill, two no-kill centers, but that is not, that's rather easy for us to do, right? Um, it's, it's, it's not something that we parade about because really we measure our success by what's happening in the entire city. And I think it's an important point to note, you know, and we'll get a lot of media questions and people are like, well, tell me how, you know, you feel about kill shelters. Um, and it's a community issue. I feel great, you know, I come from a background of, it, of having to kill, I was in shelters that killed for space too. Um, and it's really a community issue, and it's a community solution, and the public is the solution, and oftentimes we have to really start lessening our control issues and trusting each other. And it started with us doing it here, um, and being able to communicate and <coughs> disagree and not take it personally. Um, and it's, it's been huge, and we do have bundles. So we have asked two members that have been in the NKL coalition to leave, um, and it was basically because they wanted to voice their opinions not in a constructive manner, but just to make noise. And what we basically said was, please keep helping animals, don't stop what you're doing, but NKLA, we're here to really try to source through issues appropriately, meaning if I have an issue with Brenda, I'm going to go to Brenda, I'm not going to go to Facebook and, and shout to the, to the, because that's not helping animals, guys. That's just getting focused on me and how righteous I am. And that's what, that's not, that's not what we need. 
Something I want to get into a bit here and uh, get uh, folks' take on it is uh, one of the things that's been tremendously helpful uh, is very creative adoption campaigns. Uh, and you know, there's a lot, when you think about what uh, adoption, the effect that it has, uh, and the kind of how it reaches into the whole community. If you're adopting a, an animal that's already been spayed or neutered, that you're covering two bases. Uh, because, you know, then adoption is prevention. And engaging with communities often that people say, well, no, we don't adopt in that part of town. That's crazy. Uh, we need to be inclusive and engaging. We need to identify and work with animal lovers in every, every, absolutely every part of town. Uh, and so the kind of adoptions and promotions that we do are really, uh, we are uh, for the entire city. And we do low cost, free, specials, uh, two for ones, all sorts of things. And I'd like to sort of get into a bit of that perhaps. Uh, Brenda, Amy, Mark talking about some of those kinds of promotions that are often raise eyebrows, say, well, how can you trust this? Uh, let's talk about it. Yeah, we sort of um, slip it in, I guess. Uh, we started, uh, because we, we do have a lot of opinions uh, in Los Angeles. That's where that phrase, that's so LA, comes from. Uh, <laughs> And you know there are there's a group of people who thinks that a low cost or free adoptions are just horrible, and yet the national statistics shows that that is not true. I mean, I knew that from when I worked at Seattle Humane Society or San Francisco SPCA. We we followed those animals. We knew they didn't come back. We would do free adoptions, and people would come in and they would say, "I want your oldest cat who's been here the longest," and it was on a free adoption day, and the, and they loved that and. So we're, we're having to evolve a little bit in LA, but we're starting to do low cost adoptions right out of the shelters. We actually uh, did a few free adoptions a while back, and uh, we're working with a grantor who's going to make uh, cat adoptions, some of our cat adoptions free for the next year. Uh, and we're very excited about that. And, and I think, you know, p trust the animals to change people's hearts sometimes. I think that's sometimes what it takes. I mean. Uh, you know, sometimes my staff, you know, has not maybe had an animal before, and once they adopt that first animal, oh my gosh, they are different people. You know, so we have to trust the animals to teach people some things too about love. We love reduced fee and fee waived adoptions. We think that they're fantastic for a couple of reasons. You know, number one, as Brenda mentioned, and as the data actually showed, how much you paid for your pet does not affect attachment. You know, you can have people who bought their dog for $2,500 who surrender it, and people who adopted a cat that came up to their back porch that would never give up their cat for anything, right? So it's not, it's not about the price tag. So a few years ago, uh, we actually started, uh, we did a promotion that we called Nine Lives for $9. So if it was any cat nine months and older. So have any of you participated in that as network partners? So we actually, we, did, we ran that, Found Animals Foundation, we ran that in Los Angeles, and it was so successful that Julian Francis came to us and said, can we please put that, put that out nationally? We like that promotion so much. And we said, of course. It worked really well, and we ran it in the summertime when the kittens are distracting from adult cats. And at some of Brenda's shelters, adult cat adoptions went up 40% over the same period in the year prior when there hadn't been the promotion. So we're huge fans of open adoption. We're huge fans of uh, promotions, fee waived, reduced fee adoptions. We do the same adoption counseling regardless of what the price on the animal is. Uh, in our adoption centers, you know, we will take back any animal that's been one of our animals any time. We're there to support the adopters if they need it. And so from our perspective, if you've got those pieces in place, the price is not a problem. And if you can use pricing promotions to move animals that otherwise would die or would not get an opportunity, from my perspective, you should absolutely be doing that. Yes. <laughs> and often, uh, and it's understandable that uh, you know rescues have to cover costs, and so often they have, are obligated to cover costs through their adoption fees. Um, but I think if you you know look taking just a slight step up to a a, a point of view just above that, uh, engaging with a potential donor through the relationship of an adopted pet can be infinitely more valuable financially over the long term than a single adoption fee. So, uh, and building a, uh, 
a presence in the community as a lifesaver and, and getting results and doing things that are going to appeal to your donor base are all ways that will help support fee waived adoptions or low cost adoptions. So that uh, volume is really uh, the key to, to the noses out piece of the noses in, noses out uh, equation for uh, getting, moving this, these graphs in the right direction. And so looking at the big picture as opposed to the, you know, well, I need this, I need this 150 bucks or whatever it might be, uh, to how that adoption combined with other adoptions and uh, an effect of good work in the community and lives saved can, you can, can be leveraged by you to increase your donor base, to increase your, 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 the scale of your donations and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, another uh, lesson from our uh, mentor, Rich Avanzino, not personal mentor, but someone who we all have, uh, looked up to over the years, is uh, that really the public is not the problem. The public is the solution. And it's, it's when we stop thinking about the public as the problem and having this kind of uh, you know, suspicious, standoffish, hostile relationship with the public as, you know, they're just irresponsible, they don't care their pets, they don't do this, you know. So all of that kind of attitude really is so self-defeating and it just puts you further and further and further into a corner when you're at odds with everything else in the community and you're fighting, you are then, uh, you've lost. The public is the solution. The public loves animals. We <clears throat> have been tracking this kind of thing, you know, not tracking it statistically, but back when Best Friends started, uh, 32 years ago now, I think, uh, something like that. Um, the uh, 31. The, we were regarded as kind of really out on the fringe. When we were talking about no kill and uh, that the lives of every animal have intrinsic value and that they're not ours to, to take, uh, the traditional sheltering community said, you know, uh, Please, uh, we had, didn't have a place at the table, we didn't have a voice, we had no standing. Um, and over time, now that has become the center line of public opinion. And I believe it was always the center line of public opinion. The public just didn't know what was going on in the shelter. They didn't know that so many animals were being killed. But recent survey that Best Friends initiated a couple of years back indicated that uh, you know, 86% of households regard pets as part of the family. 70% of pet owners believe that uh, animals in shelter should only be killed if they are too dangerously aggressive to be adopted or too sick and suffering to, to be successfully treated. So that's basically the no-kill philosophy, and that's the public opinion. That's not them taking up, these are not people who are an, in animal welfare. This is the general public. So that's the center line of public opinion. So if that's the center line of pub public opinion, then they are our friends. We need to tap into that, and we need to use the public to help us with this issue. And it's every, it cuts across every economic uh, base, all political parties, all ethnicities, all religions, animals. Uh, there are animal lovers in every demographic, in every community, and it's up to us to really identify them and, and, and get and empower them to be influencers in their community. So before we get into uh, Q&A here, any further things you want to discuss? Can uh, I? Okay. No, please, don't go ahead. So something that Francis said that I just want to reemphasize that I hope you guys caught is that there will always be animals in the community that are too dangerously aggressive to be placed in homes or are too sick or injured to be treated. And I think that making sure that you hear that and understand that and that you acknowledge that in your conversations with your local shelters goes a long way to opening up those collaborations. Because I think sometimes, particularly municipal shelters who have a public safety responsibility and a limited budget, when you come in and say no kill, if they think you mean that means no animal ever dies in the shelter, it, it kind of creates a tension that can stop the conversation, right? But if you go in and you acknowledge to them, listen, there's this very small group of animals that are still going to need euthanasia as an option, and we acknowledge that, but we want to work with you to make that number as small as possible. That, I think, is a much more powerful, collaborative starting point for a conversation, particularly with municipal shelters, than maybe sometimes the way that we go in and talk about it. And to sort of tag on to what Amy said, I think sometimes communities tend to look at the shelter and blame them for killing the animals. I think no blame should be assigned to anyone. 
And what I, what I, you know, we just need to ask the public to help us. And what I've seen since I've been in LA is the transformation of the staff as people have gone in to help them, as people have gone in to work with us to get the animals out. That's what everyone wants, and that's what, you know, my staff wants. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we can sort of approach the shelters as being the people who are assigned to keep the animals and do the best they can and work with them, you'll see the people in your shelters start to change and they'll start to smile and say, you know, oh, we're glad to see you. They may even start calling you and saying, can you come back again today, uh, which is what we usually do. Mark, did you have something on this? No, I mean, okay. the, the only thing I guess I'll add is just for expectation purposes, you know, many of you are already doing this type of work in your community and we're always open to talking to you because um, not everything's always going to be exactly cut and paste but there's a lot of things that are going to be similar and a lot of your challenges oftentimes is cutting through the personalities and um, that is one of the most exhausting things about doing this work and sometimes it's really getting self-reflection into that as well and what your contribution to that is and it's hard you guys but it's so rewarding and there's so many positive wonderful things and, um, you know, coming from, as I said, an ex-shelter worker that performed euthanasia, just the fact that there's a light at the end of the tunnel where that is going to be this weird, crazy story that people, you know, heard about way back when is really what motivates, uh, one of the many things, obviously, that motivates me in doing this. And, a lot, you know, when, the, when we started this, one of the things that I thought was, wow, how do we challenge, how do we get so many different rescues, so many different beliefs? And they had already had a good start, just so you know, I was a year after it. We initiated, so I let them really do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> and came in after to take the glory. But um, in all honesty, I met with a guy very early on who led um, the AIDS campaign in the AIDS epidemic. And kind of similar stuff, right? Really bad, big, huge issue. All these people, you know, because to think that gay, lesbian communities all the same, they all see things the same way. So I said, How do you? How did you get all of these different individuals who could see that they all wanted the same thing to get on the same page? And I got a lot of good tips, and he just said, you know, we kept the bigger picture in mind. So he would say things like we would read people's names that died that day, you know, after we all fought for eight hours. And for us, we don't do that. But we always think of the overall goal and the fact that we have now still, you know, 8,000 animals that are still waiting for us to get it together, to get more people, to get to the public, to help them. Um, and you have shelter workers that, that want to help even if they're not, or they can't ask for it. And uh, I mean, I think that's, that's the issue, but that is the hardest thing, is keeping on goal, keeping yourself mentally um, prepared, and dealing with making tough decisions, and sticking by them and saying, well, you know, we are gonna do fee waived adoptions. And one of the reasons we took such, we took a very prominent role in that, Best Friends, um, Found Animals is doing it, other groups have been doing it a long time, but we had huge centers that now are adopting out about 5,000 animals in LA. And we caused a lot of headaches for Brenda because she <laughs> gets the emails about the free adoptions and all of that stuff. But we want to do it because the rescue groups, we know how hard it is when you go and change a philosophy like that and have a very vocal minority of people that make a lot of noise that say, how dare you? I, you obviously don't care about animals. Those really hurtful things that all of you have heard. And that's also something that we've taken the role on, to, to try to lead the way and say, this is okay, we believe it, we stand by it, we know for some people it's not popular, and uh, we're going to push through. And obviously there's many of you, and we have many support systems with each other and all of you, even if all of you aren't completely there yet, just understanding the fact that that is a much needed thing to help move the needle that you saw in that graph of going down from 23,000 total cats and dogs being killed and euthanized at 12 in three years. If I could just add one more thing, just I want to put a plug in for Amy's two o'clock on statistics and, and numbers. I promise it's fun. We make data fun. It's data dance, you guys. So, but fun. it is so important to look at your data. When you go into the city shelters in Los Angeles, you're going to think, oh my God, they don't have anything but pit bulls and pit bull mixes. So we looked at the numbers. And in the last three years, less than 20% like 18%, 19% of the dogs coming into the shelters have been pits or pit mixes. Why are they still in the, why are they still in the shelters? It takes longer to adopt them. 
and we, we, we aren't killing unless we have real tight space issues and have to, we're giving them that time. So when you come in, you're gonna, it's gonna look like LA is the city of pit bulls and chihuahuas. And, but, <laughs> but when you study the data, you can see the happy picture that, oh, they're giving them longer to get out. Yeah, and data is interesting. Again, another sort of data point here is that, you know, even after several years, we will see a data point and say, well, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. You know, we, it, it, it's apparently a very straightforward number. It, it's about the number of, you name it, cats coming from a particular area. Well, then, well, what does that mean? Are those cats being, uh, are people bringing in strays? Or, you know, like, this is particularly with regards to the kittens. Are these folks who are finding, uh, you know, a bunch of kittens in their backyard, or are they just having a cat that they keep, you know? So that's a data point that needs further breaking down. And so there are a number of things like that, that as you, you know, you, you, you have a, a data point, you apply a particular, uh, you know, you, you, you push it with some sort of program, but you see that it's going, maybe it's not changing the way you think it should be changing. Well, does that data point actually represent what you think it represents, and are you actually applying the right uh, force to move that, that data point? And uh, that is something that was kind of a learning process for me, and I think it's a learning process for all of us, that what we thought was very thorough, fine-grained, granular data can be uh, misleading and needs to be broken down further. So there's a lot of information in there. So I highly recommend Amy's uh, uh, session this afternoon. Another thing, finally, is that before we open it up, that, uh, and I failed to mention this, that Best Friends adheres to a universally positive message. Our messaging is we're not showing barrels of dead animals. We're not, uh, you know, saying, you know, if you don't take this animal, it's going to die. Um, if you don't get this animal out of the shelter, Brenda's going to kill it. If you don't have, you know, so, and trust me, it's, uh, that's not. <laughs> it happens in some communities. <laughs> it happens in some communities. So, uh, so positivity, and positivity is what people, engages people. Uh, you know, people can only take so much negative crap before they get worn out and they just tune you out. Uh, and they, yeah, they may say, okay, I'm gonna write a check, but they're not engaged. We want people to be engaged, we want people to feel part of things, we want people to be part of the success of all of this, and that's done with positive stories, positive images, positive uh, relationship to the whole thing. Okay, let's do some Q&A. Q&A. The microphone's coming from the back. Wait until it gets to you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm an independent rescuer out of Miami, and I, I'm happy to see that they are here at the conference. Yeah. They are a very similar environment to LA. They have the same type of demographic challenges that y'all had with um, language barriers, undocumented barriers, similar pit bull chihuahua population. Um, how can I help our shelter in getting to no kill? What, what, what can you, I do? What do you specialize in? Um, I, I rescue, I, I pull um, injured and damaged, the unadoptables, um, and try to rehabilitate them. That's huge. Yeah. That's absolutely huge. I mean, we, you know, in LA, we do have vets in all of our shelters, and we have RVTs, and we do have medical teams, but they can't do it all. And so to, we have people in LA who pull the medically challenged. They take them out, they spend a lot of money on them, they put them in foster, they rehabilitate them, and they rehome them. That's huge, that's a huge contribution. Just keep doing it. Yep, I mean, the one, the one approach that we took in LA, and honestly, it's really gonna ultimately result to what your goal and your mission is for, for your group. But, you know, we looked at a very systematic population approach because we tried to keep in mind I don't know what Dave County's um, statistics are, but we've used data to say, oh my gosh, Maltese's are dying, Las Opsas are dying. What is the easiest and most quick approach that I can start breaking, we can start breaking down that huge gap? And we started with um, probably the easiest and quickest to place versus the hardest, um, which was really hard for some people. They say, oh, they just take all the adoptable. The adoptable ones are dying right now. When the adoptable ones stop dying, we're gonna go to the next, and then we're gonna go to the next and then we're going to go to the next. And that's where we're at with kittens right now. Yeah. But literally started that approach. We were very heavy transport uh, in LA for the first couple of years. We don't do nearly any transports for Brenda anymore because we can place all of those transport side candidates in the city. 
locally. Yeah, and like for example, my adoption centers, we no longer pull small dogs from her shelters ever. She doesn't need help with small dogs anymore. If we're, what we are pulling from her shelters are cats, kittens, large dogs, because that's what still needs help. So something that might be interesting is to ask them what would be most helpful, yeah. right? Because sometimes, and this is what, something we see in LA, is be, through the NKLA program and some other things going on, things have changed in the city's shelter so much in three years. And some people have not wrapped their mind around that change. So they remember when the small fluffies were dying in the city of LA, and they don't realize that that's not happening anymore, and that pulling those dogs is no longer helpful, right? So sometimes it's a matter of you know, looking at the data and asking the agency, and you sometimes might be surprised what they say they really need help with. Like in LA, one of the things that Mark and Francis are doing is more groups want to help dogs than cats. There's just there's more groups out there that are dog focused than cat focused. Cats need more help. So we're actively lobbying within the coalition. If you're a dog group, great, love you. Can you take a few litters of kittens? <laughs> seriously, seriously, because the kittens are what needs help. The cats are what needs help. So like, hey, if you're in this coalition and you're in it to getting us to no kill, that's cats and dogs and love you guys, but unless, you know, the cats are what needs the help. So I get that you're a dog group, but are some of your volunteers willing to do some kittens? And some of them are. Our second biggest cat. Okay, we've got a mic here. Our second biggest cat. It's good to know now to what, exactly what Amy's talking about. Our second largest cat adoption agency in NKLA now is a group called Labs and Friends. So we expanded <laughs> on Friends. Um, <laughs> in two years, they're huge. They're the number two cat rescue now. And there's a group in called. NKLA. And there's a group called Angel City Pit Bulls, right? And they're now there's they're now doing kitties, <laughs> kitties and kitties, yeah. Kitties and kitties, yes, right here. My name is Jennifer. I'm from Little Long Island in New York. New York. Um, in my first time attending your conference, um, I've cried a lot. Tears of happiness. I'm proud of what Best Friends is doing, and I'm happy to be here. My question being from New York is, um, is there anything, any plans in the pipeline and I'm proud of LA and what they've done. They've come a long way. I'm looking at the statistics. They're fantastic. But living in New York and seeing what the NYACC is doing and what other shelters are doing, it's so depressing. And I wanted to know if there's anything, any plans in the pipeline for New York? Well, yes, we have a program in New York. Uh, we've had a program in New York since 2009. We host super adoptions and events and you know fundraisers for local rescues. But we are now working more uh, consistently with NYCACC, and uh, I think they've just changed their name, but it's still the same uh, letters. And uh, we are doing, have a number of animals in foster, and we're opening up an adoption center in New York, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, later this year, that will be all essentially strictly NYCACC animals. And there's an equivalent job posting of my job in New York currently, so there's definitely huge plans in New York. We're starting to work with any, I actually will be meeting with them on Wednesday, next week. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Hi, I was wondering if there's any uh, interest that you've heard of for no-kill in Sacramento, if anybody's working on that in Sacramento? In Sacramento, California? Sacramento? Yes. Well, goodness, Sacramento is actually really lucky. I mean, you guys have Gina, and she has basically taken that shelter as pretty darn close, right? And she's doing it with not much and there's pretty good cooperation between the agencies there. So I would say relative to a lot of other places, Sacramento is already well on the path. They've got a leader, they've got resources, they're doing creative things. So yeah, Front Street is a very different place than it was five years ago. The, and they're very collaborative. Years ago when I worked up in Northern California, we were pulling, for private shelters, we were pulling animals from Sacramento. They've, they've been open to that. Yes. Sorry, uh, who's running the mic? Who's got it? Okay, there you go. Hi, um, my name's Corinne. I'm also, f I live in New York, but I'm from Los Angeles, and I ditto everything you just said, you in the front, back from New York. It's, uh, it's my first attending conference as well. Um, my question was about um, uh, the, free, the free adoptions, this, the concept. I, I work. I volunteer in a small shelter at Animal Haven, um, 
going to be working with the ACNC, um, but one of the things I always thought about uh, paying for an adoption was that it might be an indicator that somebody would be able to care for in the long term the medical costs of most animals that wind up adopting human diseases. I just lost both mine who wound up having a series of human diseases that I never thought they would ever have. So the years and the money that it, that it took, and I was fortunate that I could do that, and I know not everyone can. How is there, are there funds through all of the, the various programs that can help fund um, people who are uh, through the uh, free adoption programs, if their animals become ill, how do they how do how do they get cared for? I, I think it's important to note that at free adoption. If you pull people in this room, how many people have free pets? You're gonna have a lot. So it has no indication as to what how much money they make. So I yeah, don't assume. Clients, yeah. So I think the free adoptions don't tie into can they care for their pet or not. Statistically, there's there's no backing to that fee, but to your point before, anybody who's underserved, any of us who don't make a lot of money that get um, introduced to huge medical bills is going to be an issue to your point, right? And, and is there... Are and there there's, there's no way to know, right? So if a, if a cat is going to live 10 or 15 or 20 years, or a dog is going to live 10 or 12 years, even if somebody has a great job now, you can't guarantee that they're not going to fall on hard times, become disabled, have yeah. something happen over the lifetime of that pet. So just because somebody's got money now does not mean they'll be able to provide lifetime care. So I think what Mark and I are saying is that's not, don't worry about that up front. The point you're making is a good one, but I would put it in sort of a different category, which is veterinary care is expensive, and the way that our economy is going is there's a smaller and smaller group of haves and a larger and larger group of have-nots. And for most of the people in the have-not category, right, even if they can feed their pet and provide shelter, if they get hit with a $5,000 vet bill, it's impossible. So that is an, an issue that goes beyond adoption policies and beyond adoption fees that I think the veterinary industry and the animal welfare industry hasn't worked out yet. But the other thing is, uh, let's talk a little bit about the programs that we mentioned that Downtown Dogs, with the support of Found Animals, started in Los Angeles. At three of our largest shelters, we have a shelter intervention program. So when people come in and say, I don't want to give up this animal, but he or she has such and such going on, it could be a medical problem that they need assistance with financially for. It could be as simple as a hole in the fence that they can't fix. But, it, but a lot of times it is something big. These intervention groups uh, help them and they find resources for them. And, and I, personally what I think is that we need interventions at every shelter around the country to help people because, you know, really um, some people make more money than others, but everyone deserves the companionship and the love of an animal. So I think we need to make that possible. It's definitely the trend moving forward. There, there's a lot of recognition around the fact that there needs to be support for medical medical support for people that are living with poverty level. They deserve to have their animals, but if they don't have resources or even have facilities to even get care, um, that's an issue. And it has to be addressed, absolutely. It's still up Well, every community is different. You do have groups in certain communities. Uh, Some of those resources are available in Los Angeles, but I'd be lying if I told you that there were resources available for everybody who needed them. Yeah. And one of the things that we, uh, you know, we have follow up, we maintain uh, contact with all of our uh, adopters, they are uh, free to bring the animals back. Our, our adoption policies and the way we approach it, the, the interviews are not uh, interrogations that people feel that they, if they have to say, hey, uh, this isn't working out, that they failed. Uh, it's a dialogue, it's a relationship. So if they have, so that's a long-term relationship. If they have a problem, they're not able to keep their pet. It's, they are encouraged at any point to, to bring that animal back. Um, and that goes to another component of uh, adoption policy, uh, which is the transformation of the whole adoption screening process, which in many cases is uh, really counterproductive and uh, puts people, drives people to the, the puppy store, the pet store, because why, do I, why should I be humiliated by somebody uh, on this ridiculous screening process uh, 
when I can just go buy a dog. I'm trying to save a dog. They don't want me to save a dog. They want to put me through hell. Well, well I'm going to go. I'll, why bother? So how many of you are married? Okay. How many of you would have married, because it's mostly women, I'll say your husband, based on your first date? Not a lot of hands. <laughs> but basically, right, when it comes to returns, this is what we ask of people. We ask of people to spend an hour or two with an animal in an environment that is completely different than their home, and then to make a 10-year commitment, no matter what. It's crazy. Right, do the best that you can in counseling them, but then if it doesn't work out, instead of that being a shameful thing, you're a terrible person, all right, you know what, bring the animal back. Now you may know more about what you're looking for. Now we may have more information about how that animal acts in a home environment. We can go on to make a better match for that pet Sorry. and for that person, right? So it's just, it's, it's Francis is talking yeah. about don't interrogate on the front end, and I'm talking about returns are not a dirty word. Yeah. And if you're the person that they hope they never have to meet again, they're not going to bring you the dog back. Yes. You know, so that's, uh, or the cat. So you, you don't want to be that person who's just kind of, you know, got them pinned against the wall and sort of, uh, you know, waterboarding them to try and get the right information out of them. <laughs> you want to have a relationship with them. You want to be their friend so that they, if they have a problem, they will come back to you. Not that they are going to be afraid to come back to you. You guys, I want to also point out, just so you know, the four of us, as well as hopefully we can round up this symmetric hope and search out one, which is also a great coalition member, will be at the exhibit hall for an hour and a half, most of us. Over lunch. Uh, to talk to you guys too. So if you don't get your questions five answered now. Okay, we have five minutes. Uh, so we got a few one more in the questions. Back. Hi, my name is Randy Sandberg. I live in Alameda County. My husband over here and I have been fostering dogs from Mudville. We have seven dogs, four of which are failed fosters. <laughs> and I volunteered recently at our animal shelter in Alameda County. And went through the whole background check and stuff. But they won't let me do anything because of my disability. But I was thinking, when you talk about your surrender prevention program, I'd like to hear more about that. And if there are people that need, want to give up their pets because they feel they can't take care of them, because they lost their jobs or they need medical care for the pet. How do you find the resources to do that? Because I'm thinking, well, maybe I could talk the well, shelter. Let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off so we get another question, but I, I think I get your point. And I think the thing is that we're, uh, you do have things like food bank. You have, a, you know, for small, um, relatively, uh, Small is, is, is a relative term when it comes to veterinary costs, but for uh, veterinary costs that they're unable to, to fit, to fit, put the bill up, they can receive some help. Also, and if you if come talk to me in the exhibit hall, I can give you a lot more detail, and I can send you to a presentation that's on our website that gives more details about how Downtown yeah. Dog does their program. And if you go to Downtown Dog's website, they have a blog where they talk a lot about what they do, and their Facebook page has a lot of great resources. It's not, it's not an easy question to answer, but we'll do our best to get you started. Okay. Thank you. You have the mic. I have a mic. I don't know. <laughs> you have the mic. You have the power. <laughs> so much power. Okay. Um, I'm from St. Louis, and I'm from 10th Life. And First of all, I want to say that I have a free cat that I got whenever I was maybe tw 20. He is very old now, and <laughs> as am I. <laughs> but uh, he's cost me about $10,000 now, so it does not. it's not really an indicator. <laughs> or in my case, it wasn't. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, we have a lot of volunteers who, and I, we operate from a place of positivity, the way that Best Friends does, and I really appreciate that about you guys. Um, but how do you encourage volunteers? I know you said you had to get rid of one or two. How do you encourage volunteers to stay on that path of positivity and see things, like see the public as... Um, as a good thing, rather than as you know, just a bunch of idiots, which is what we hear a lot. <laughs> so, some of it and I don't agree with. It. Some of it might be leading by example. I mean, that's what I saw when I when I was working under Rich Avanzino. Was everything was positive. You want to help? Okay, good. Let's find out how you fit. And um, you know, if someone is really taking it to a Facebook campaign, um, 
there's not a whole lot as a city agency we can do because of freedom of speech. But we can talk to that person and say, you know, I think the animals might be better served if it was a positive message. That's, that's what we can do. I, I don't know if Mark wants to take that differently from the best friend's perspective. I constantly, for myself, for my staff, for my volunteers, are constantly talking about the positive, constantly hammering it home. Uh, we tend to really go to that place anytime a negative thing happens because we want to prevent it from ever happening. So it really is a constant um, re-education on the bigger picture mission that we're doing and pointing out our accomplishments. Um, a lot of counseling. I don't, I don't try to let things go unnoticed. So if I hear somebody make a comment or something like that, I will sit down and a lot of time. Yeah. And sit down and have a conversation say, hey, I understand what you're going through here, but let me, let me talk to you about it. Because they are representatives of us, too. Yeah. So it's really important that if you are in a supermarket and you're adding some of your best friends and they're blasting Brenda, yeah. you know, that's, that's a rough You know they're numbers. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're wrong. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, and so oftentimes, you know, if it gets to a point where they're really bad, I'll give them other options because the great thing about animal welfare is there's so many groups yeah. that have different philosophies. And I'll say, just don't stop helping animals, but let me give you some groups that yeah. I think are going to fit. And that doesn't mean that objectively there aren't, there aren't really some stupid people out there. That's yeah. not what we're saying. <laughs> what we're saying is that the public as a whole is not, yeah. this is they're not so of an us problem. and them. Yeah. And, 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 and engaging with those folks, we still need to be a kind, compassionate, thoughtful, and it's just not worth the negativity of getting, in, getting down, going down that road. Apart from anything, it's such a waste of time. Anyway, we're zeroed out. That's it. Um, if you have a, a question, in the... Uh, Ready to the hall. We'll be there. Yeah. Right. Thank you.